Hello and welcome to the HSC 2017 Legal Studies ATAR Notes Revising the Fussy Things Lecture. Um, what inspired me to create um, a video on this kind of content is that a lot of students were asking how they can succeed in multiple choice, how they can get more marks than what they're currently getting. And there's a whole bunch of things that play into how we perform in multiple choice. And I'll be discussing a section on this at the very end of this video here. But part of it is not understanding a lot of wordplay things, being confused about the differences between, between things that sound quite similar. So we're just gonna go through some of these, iron them out now, because I know it's not something that we sit down and do in our own study. We think, oh yeah, like, I kinda know what that means, that's fine. I'll I'll survive, I'll be able to wing it. So this bit here is about sitting down, actually ironing out some of the things that are really confusing to students. Um, some of them were confusing to me as a student, um, my friends, my peers, and also some of this comes from things that students have told me this year that they are struggling with. So let's start off with social and situational crime prevention. We're introduced to this fairly early on in the syllabus and it's a shame that both of these start with S because as a kind of a, a word person, I find it easier to differentiate if things sound different. But unfortunately, we've got a nice little bit of alliteration at play here. So to distinguish between the two, social crime prevention is about looking at the social and economic reasons why someone may turn to criminal activity in the first place. And it's about deterring them from that, um, equipping them with the support and the utensils they need, the knowledge even, to be able to make decisions avoiding a life of criminality or just criminal decisions even if it's just a one-off. So it's a lot of the time about increasing or encouraging education. Um, it's about looking at family structures a lot of the time and, and recognizing the way a family can have a big impact on um, children, but also parents' decision-making when it comes to criminal activity. Um, and looking at things like addiction, um, addiction to drugs or alcohol or gambling, any of these things that can cause someone to be able to want to turn to a life of crime in order to fund or fuel this kind of um, addiction. And so it's talking about social crime prevention is the things that happen in the early stages. So we're not at the point of wanting to commit the crime yet, so to say, but we're looking at the reasons why someone might commit a crime and trying to adjust them um, in a very like meaningful way, essentially. And so that's what social crime prevention is. Situational crime prevention, you may have even had your own hand at. If you work in retail like I do, maybe you have being a part of situational crime prevention yourself. Situational crime prevention is getting someone to back out of a crime or to discourage them or physically stop them from committing the crime at the time. So they're actually in the situation of wanting to commit the crime and then we take away the incentive or we make it too difficult or the likelihood of them getting caught is too great. And so this causes someone to back out or no longer commit the crime. That is situational crime prevention. So some simple examples of this is it could be very simple like you see someone who you think is suspicious as they're walking down the aisle and a co-worker has told you this person tends to shove uh, chocolate down their pants so you just go down the chocolate aisle and you just stand in the chocolate aisle and they're not going to go down there and shove things down their pants right in front of you and so that in a very very simple form is situational crime prevention that they see a staff member they realize that the reward or it's going to be too difficult has been taken away so they won't commit the crime anymore it's too difficult they're going to be caught they're not an idiot uh, we hope and so they're not going to commit the crime anymore. So that's a really, really simple and quite superficial level of situational crime prevention. But it is situational crime prevention nonetheless. It's being in the situation and getting someone to change their mind about committing the crime. It could also mean making the crime just too difficult to commit. Um, so for some people, this might be that um, in service stations, uh, at, in night, at the night time, if you use the bathroom in there on the odd occasion that you would ever need to do that, um, you might find that a lot of them, they don't have the normal white or yellow lights, but they have blue lights. The purpose of the blue light is that it makes it really difficult for someone to locate a vein in their arm so they can't inject um, drugs into their arm or wherever they are in their body um, because it's actually impossible for them to locate the vein when the blue light is above them. Um, so that's an actually another situational crime prevention example of making it impossible to commit the crime or the reward just isn't great enough because they might not get the outcome that they're hoping for. So situational crime prevention is about being in the situation. Social crime prevention is about the beforehand, everything that leads up to committing the crime. 
Um, in terms of situational crime prevention, I know a lot of textbooks also provide the examples of um, CCTV cameras um, being around areas that aren't otherwise monitored. That's an excellent example of situational crime prevention, that someone sees a camera and they think, well, I'm obviously not going to commit a crime in front of this camera, seeing as there's evidence. Um, and I know some textbooks also talk about playing classical music in areas that um, are seen as a hangout for people that might be quite, um, quite causing havoc and chaos. And so they play classical classical music as a way of deterring people to move on, but also potentially just changing the ambiance of the general area as well. So situational crime prevention can seem like really superficial things like just standing down the chocolate aisle so that person isn't going to shove, shove chocolate down their pants in front of you and then walk on out, are they? It can be quite superficial like that or it can be more mechanical and very well planned things like using CCTV footage. Now I've put in here a few different words that um, people get confused with. When I first started doing these lectures, I asked my friend Molly, who really struggled with legal studies sometimes, and she came to love the subject in the end, which is my happiest story of all. But I asked her what she really struggled with, and she said one of the things was the R's. Uh, ratification, rehabilitation, recidivism, remand, remorse, and so forth. There were so many words that sounded similar to her, and she wasn't being able to make the differentiation. Now beyond Molly, and into you guys here, there might be words in the syllabus or in your textbooks that you think you understand because you've heard them here or there, but when you actually have to look at them in the situation of a multiple choice, you start to overthink the words and it can mean a lot, especially if they've put a bunch of these different words as the different answers and you've got to work out which the scenario is best. Is it showing ratification, rehabilitation, remand, remorse, etc.? It can be tricky like that and when you're in a situation a multiple choice you do start to overthink the words so it really helps if you have a really good and clear understanding of what the words are to begin with this goes beyond words that start with r of course have a look back in your notes now in your textbook most textbooks have got like a, a glossary at the end um, or they use they use bold or different colors for words that are important terminology flick through your textbook and have a look and make note of any that you're not completely 110% certain and comfortable with because that'll be really important for your multiple choice later on. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this for the reason that this features pretty heavily in the preliminary syllabus, but the separation of powers is still relevant, more so than the division of powers, um, particularly to human rights part of the syllabus. The division of powers isn't featured as strong. In saying that, I have seen situations in multiple choice questions or short answers um, where they're talking about, they want you to talk about the separation of powers, but they've also put the division of powers in there as a potential option of multiple choice. It's tricky um, because for the reason that it sounds similar and we're thinking back to preliminary to make the distinction. So it can catch a lot of people out, myself included. I lost a mark in my trial over this. I remember it so clearly and thinking it was such a rot that they put division of powers in there when that was never going to be the answer. But I just didn't know the difference between the two. So if you have been shying away from this the entire time because you can't work out the difference, the time is now. Like I said, I'm a bit of a word person. So the way I remember this, that I need to be talking about the separation of powers, is that I understand the separation of powers is important because if all the power is lumped together in one spot, potentially a disaster could happen. Our checks and balances are all thrown out the window. Um, it's too easy for someone to accumulate all of the power in the way our entire system is governed, and it can be very dangerous. So we need the uh, separation of powers in order to protect our human rights and also our democracy as it stands. Um, this, so what the way I imagine this is if, if there was no separation, everything is together and something bad happens when it's all together. I think of my niece and nephew and when the two of them are together and they're arguing, I'm never going to say to them, divide yourselves. I'm going to say, separate, both of you, separate now. I'm more likely to say something like separate and to me, that's the way I remember it. When my niece and nephew are together and they're screaming and crying and yelling at each other, something bad's going to happen. When all of the power is together and they're screaming and crying and they're whatever, something bad's going to happen. So we need to separate the powers in order to protect the human rights and we need to separate my niece and nephew in order to protect my general sanity. So this is an example that I use to remember separation of powers. I know it won't work for everyone, but if you're struggling with remembering these, do think quite clearly about how you can remember this because it is important. It could cost you a mark in multiple choice. 
Uh, just to briefly go over the purpose of separation of powers in relation to human rights, it's important because if everything was in the one hand, our checks and balances for promoting and enforcing human rights go out the window. We need to separate the executive, legislative, legislature and judiciary arms. We need to have them separated so the people who make the laws, the people that we vote in for power and the people who enforce the laws, laws in the courts are completely separate. So there's three different stages there that we need to keep separate. And that's not to say that they may not work together at different times. That's completely understandable in order to have a functioning system, but it's something that we need to be aware of. So in the situation of um, dictatorship, we are preventing this through the separation of powers, essentially. It sounds like quite an extreme circumstance, especially coming from an Australian perspective, uh, but this is the basis of it. Just quickly, I want to talk about charge negotiation or plea bargaining. I've had a few students this, uh, this year ask me what the difference is between the two of them. I know that in America, it's far more common to talk about plea bargaining than it is charge negotiation. So when you go online and you're writing your study notes and you're Googling things about charge negotiation, a lot of resources come up that use plea bargaining. The words of the syllabus is charge negotiation, so that's what we should use. It is more or less the same thing with differentiation for obviously the US system as compared to ours. Um, but charge negotiation is the term we should be using. So if you haven't even come across plea bargaining, so be it. But I know a lot of students come across this and they're confused about what the difference is. Um, but when you're writing your responses, you should be using charge negotiation. On a similar level of different terms that can become confusing, the syllabus and most textbook refer to summons. However, summons are no longer used in the New South Wales criminal justice system. If you have an updated textbook, um, maybe this won't be a problem for your, for your textbook, but it still exists in the syllabus. The reason I bring this up is it's now called a court attendance notice. Um, I've called, um, the in the notes that um, we have available, ATAR notes, I've written a thing about this here. I've created my own mock court attendance notice that you can see in the notes there for the reason that I wanted to point out that the syllabus calls it a summons but it is a court attendance notice. It was used in the 2015 multiple choice, um, the word summons, despite the fact that obviously we don't use that anymore in our legal system. The Legal Studies um, Association um, took it up to Board of Studies at the time um, about the terminology and there's a communication there. And I wanted to pass that on to students as well um, to say that you may feel confused and it does come down to a very wordy situation in a multiple choice and you might be unsure. But basically, although the syllabus used the word summons, we now call it a court attendance notice in New South Wales. They are the same thing. Um, it's not incorrect, so to say, to use one, especially considering it is the words used in the syllabus. I'm, I'm only just updating you in case you are looking through your notes so you're looking online and you're realizing that the syllabus and the textbook are saying different things. Um, it's nothing to worry about. It really isn't. Um, I don't expect it would be in another multiple choice after being in 2015 anyway. Not something to worry about. On a more minor level, we're going in zooming deeper into words that sound similar, but they are different things. So summary offences, I think of summary offences and indictable offences. They are more or less like the opposites, the two different types of offences that I consider when I'm making my own notes. Summary offences are considered less severe and they are outlined in the legislation I've popped on screen there. Summarily trialed means to be heard in a court with a magistrate and no jury. I think it would be pretty ghastly if this came up in a multiple choice because it's not something we hear about often. Um, but I wanted to put it in there because I know that I certainly came across it. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we understood the difference there. But when we're talking about court jurisdiction, which is something that students definitely get confused with um, in the course, and I completely understand why, working out at what point different uh, different cases go to different courts and when it goes to appeal it gets even more complicated I understand. A summary only court, um, the Land and Environment Court is summary only for example. It just means it doesn't use a jury. Um, in the legal studies notes as well I've put in a, a court hierarchy so you can understand the jurisdiction of New South Wales and Australia wide courts as well. Just touching over Dolly Inca packs here as well. Uh, it's a good thing to um, touch on, especially because it does come down to numbers for this part. So in the multiple choice, it's easy enough to get caught up with this. Uh, the way I remember it is I actually, um, I wrote something up very similar to what you see on screen. I just wrote it up and I put it on um, 
nice colored paper. I stuck it up on my desk so I could look at it each day. And I just kind of remembered it like that because I knew that I'm, I'm not very good with numbers to begin with. And so I'm going to remember it. This is the way it works for me. If you've got a great memory, um, this is fine, of course. But in a situation of a multiple choice where it's got a scenario based question where it asks you to, um, to evaluate what's happening and they put it in age and age means all the difference to the correct answer in this situation. Um, so I put that on screen there. We can have a look at that. Make sure you understand it in your own notes. Um, I've underlined the rebuttable presumption of Dolly Incapax. It's an important term to understand as well. Um, we're not predicting that young offenders will come up as an essay question this year, considering it came out last year. Not to say we should not study young offenders at all, though, of course. Uh, this could very well come up at any point, um, especially in multiple choice. The actus reus and mens rea, um, I simply remember this, that actus reus is the guilty act, actus act, simply. Uh, mens rea is the intention, mens, I think of mentality. So the mentality behind the actus reus, so to say. It's just ever so brief. I wanted to bring it up because sometimes you need to identify this in, again, a situational scenario-based multiple choice question. And then lastly, the things I wanted to focus on in terms of terminology, manslaughter. It came out in my trial exam. It asked me to identify if what the scenario was. Was it voluntary, involuntary or constructive manslaughter? And I was definitely very confused. I came out, I couldn't even remember learning this in class. It's because it's such a tiny little aspect of most people's textbooks. But it was a multiple choice question in my trial and I got it wrong and I lost the point. So this is why I'm bringing it up now because you never know it could come up again. Voluntary manslaughter occurs when the offender kills with intent, like murder, but there are mitigating factors like the defense of provocation. Involuntary manslaughter is the death occurred because the offender acted in a negligent or um, reckless way, but they did not intend to kill. Constructive manslaughter is the killing of a person whilst the offender was carrying out another illegal act without the intention to kill or even to inflict serious bodily harm. So let's go through this really quickly. Here's a scenario. An offender assaulted a person on the street. The intention was only to shake up the victim. However, the victim fell and hit the head and consequently died. This could very well be a multiple choice question on its own. And the question will say, um, which, of, which of the following describes the situation most accurately? And you'll be given a whole bunch of different types of manslaughters, maybe murder as well. The answer is constructive manslaughter. This one's a bit funny. A piano removalist found that the piano would not fit through the door of the apartment building since the renovations were done. The owners didn't want the piano anymore as it was water damaged and not worth anything. So the removalist threw the piano out the window that led to a dumpster. A person sifting through the dumpster was squashed and died. The removalist had no idea the person was underneath. What kind of manslaughter is this? Involuntary. And that leaves us with the last one. A woman killed her daughter aged 12 with intent. The court found the offender had an extremely low IQ and the offender successfully used the partial defense of diminished responsibility. Voluntary manslaughter. So we go through these. I want to give you examples, practical examples of looking at the question and reading them really carefully. In a situation of manslaughter, we're looking specifically at the actus reus and the mens rea. Um, that's really important, which is why I popped that on a slide previously, because it makes all the difference to you determining what kind of crime is being committed and exactly what the answer is for the multiple choice. All right, great job. Welcome to the end of the video. How exciting. Uh, the reason we went over these for the fussy things is because after people asking how to write essays for legal studies, when we asked for feedback on what do you want to see in these lectures, people were saying multiple choice. How do I boost my marks in multiple choice? There's a lot to it. It's not as simple as saying like remain calm in an exam. That's a huge part of it, of course. Um, but some tips that I use, for example, is there will be different ways to answer different questions. Number one, you obviously want to make sure you're reading the question clearly. A simple misunderstanding of a word could lead to a very big difference in interpretation of exactly what's going on in the question. So read things carefully, highlight things, underline things, whatever you need to do. There will be some questions where you can read the question and it will be best for you to think of the answer and then try find the answer in the options below. There will be other times when it's the process of elimination. You're going to look into the answers and you think, oh, it could be this one, could be this one, but it's definitely not this one, and it's definitely not this one. Then you back down to two. So instead of four, you've narrowed it down to two. 
read the question again, go through the answers again. See which sounds most likely. Just say the answer of this and then ask yourself, why might this not be the answer? If you can't find a reason, it's probably the answer. But if you go through it and think, actually, this conflicts with this little part of the scenario, especially for the questions that are situation-based, where it says such and such, what party to the crime is John? Or um, what is this a best example of? Or whatever it is. Those situation ones can catch you out. You've got to pay attention. Don't try and fly through them. I know it's more stressful because there's like three sentences instead of just one. You've really got to slow down, rake it back and go through it from there. In terms of all the other little fussy things in the crime and human rights syllabus, I've made notes of them in here in the ATAR notes notes you can have a look at. I've made a very conscious attempt when I was writing these to make sure that I'm highlighting things that students get confused about. I've put in case spaces and I've put in little definitions. I've even got some little charts and stuff like that because I know it's easier to remember things for some people when it's visual. I've got all kinds of things in here including your media articles, complete case breakdowns, everything like that. And most importantly for me, because I'm a word person, I make sure that I had written different ways that I'd remember different words. I made sure that things were in bold or underlined if they were to be brought to your attention. So these notes were not just the notes I use in my HSC, they are created specifically for you, then specifically in the mind of students that I was, in the mind of students that you are, and in the mind of students that are on atarnotes.com, and they're letting us know what they need help with. That is why I know this is an incredibly useful resource. You can jump onto atarnotes.com and ask any kind of questions you want completely for free, and we'll help you out. And you can go up to the shop tab up the top, and you can get your hands on one of these. There's all sorts of other subjects up there as well, so check them out. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Good luck with the HSC. Please check out all the other videos for legal studies, and if you're doing studies of religion, I will see you there as well. Bye.